I don't know if you're aware, but my oldest daughter, who's over there right now learning, is going to graduate from her home school this year, uh, school year. And I hope that uh, many years from now, she'll have good memories of our studies together. You know, there's always difficulties, you know, especially early on when you're trying to teach your own child at home. Uh, just for my children, we felt that was the best uh, way to do it. And believe me, after going through all these years of teaching and homeschool, I have a renewed appreciation for the teaching profession, and I don't have the certificate but uh, thankfully she can learn better than what I can teach her. And uh, especially since being uh, through this experience with her for so many years, I tried, I can think back to back when I was in school and some of the teachers that I had. And at my age, I'm a little surprised at how many of the teachers I can still remember. I don't know if you can remember teachers that you've had from many years ago or not. But as I started to think about the teachers that I've had, um, I found it, it's interesting. The ones I tend to remember are the ones I either really liked or really didn't like. Sort of the ones in the middle just sort of got jumbled together, I guess, in my mind. But there was... Um, the ones that I really enjoyed were the ones that could, as they say, uh, teach outside the box. I know we have uh, a, teach, a former teacher here, and I'm sure that person uh, can understand what I'm talking about. Uh, for instance, if it's history, they try to make it more than just memorizing facts and dates and things like that. Or if it's science, it's more than just knowing formulas and stuff like that. And if it's math, it's more than just practicing a problem step by step, but applying it to your world and how can you, uh, you know, uh, use this in real life. I think that the teachers that have that ability, and I'm not sure if it's something that they can really be taught, I just... Some of it might just be, by nature, they're just good teachers, you know. But one example of a really good teacher that comes to my mind is one, it was a math class back in elementary school, and I don't remember a lot about learning long division. I can still do it. Uh, but anyway, I remember, and I'll never forget this, what the teacher did was he had, he would put a long division problem up on the chalkboard, and then he would have the first student go up and let's say you're dividing five into 735. You know, you take the five into the seven, how many times did it go? And then you multiply and subtract it and do all that stuff. Well, the first kid would go up and do the first number. And then he'd sit down and the second kid would take the problem from there and do the second and so on. So let's say the first student gets that number wrong. I think there's basically two teaching methods. You could correct it on the spot, say, no, that's wrong, it should be one. Five doesn't go into seven two times, it's only one. You could do that. This teacher didn't do that, though. This teacher allowed the mistake up on the board and didn't say a word. That way, hopefully, one of the following students would know something is wrong here. When I try to work out the problem, it's not going to work. And it, it's, it provides teachable moments for the students. And one of the big lessons for, that I remembered coming from that is we would always assume the teacher's right and the teacher is always going to correct me when I'm wrong. Not, that's not how it is in the real world, is it? So that was aside from just going long division. And that's why that gentleman still sticks in my mind as one of the best teachers I've probably ever had. And that's just one example of many. And I hope you're sort of following that illustration. It's sort of hard, you know, without being able to write it up there and show it and so forth. But sometimes a good teacher will allow a human mistake in order, again, to provide a teachable moment. And uh, God is no different in that regard. God, think of the millions, billions most likely, if not more of mistakes that humans uh, commit in a day. Does God go and fix all them? No, he doesn't. He allows them to play out for reasons we'll never know. Maybe some he'll bring to our attention, but that's a whole other issue uh, altogether. But God does it whether he corrects us or not, in accordance with his goodwill. 
And with that as the introduction, I want to look at the original 12 apostles in the Bible. And we'll read uh, one of the uh, entries regarding uh, specifically how they were called and early on in the uh, ministry of these apostles. And we find this passage in Matthew chapter 10. If you're following in your pew Bible, it's on page 688, but we'll read the first 20 verses of this chapter. And uh, when it says he, the context is Jesus. So beginning in Matthew 10, verse 1, it says he called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions, Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your word, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before the governors and kings and witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it is not he, for, um, sorry, uh, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. So when you read through the Bible, you notice that each time the 12 apostles are listed, two things we notice about that, and I only read the one. You can look in the other Gospels for the others. Peter's always listed first. Judas Iscariot always listed last. If we only had one instance and that was the case, might not think much of it, but when you see a pattern repeating, it might mean something. And I think it's uh, not mere random order. I think it's pretty obvious Peter's listed first. He was the rock upon which the church uh, was built. And Judas, on the other hand, Matthew uh, mentions for us, he's the traitor. He betrayed Jesus. So therefore, he deserves to go last. I don't know if it really means much for the guys in the middle, but first in the end, uh, probably means something there. So here's the thing, though. Judas Iscariot, and I hope we're all familiar with the name and what he is known for, betraying Jesus. What do you think of when you hear the name Judas? Do you think like I do, betrayal, traitor, enemy, anything like that? Because his name is synonymous with those things that I mentioned. Uh, now, one of the first things we see in the Bible tied to Judas, though, is nothing bad. And that's the interesting thing. So we wouldn't expect it. What we learn in this passage in Matthew 10 is that Judas, along with the other 11, was given all these powers by Christ himself. He was given the power to cleanse and to heal and to drive out spirits and raise the dead. Judas Iscariot he was able to do all those things. We don't read a specific instances of him doing it, but... Clearly, he was given the power, so we have to assume that through 
what the three-year ministry when Jesus was on the earth that his disciples were doing these things and Judas was right in the thick of this. Now, if that is the case, and it seems like it is, uh, the obvious question follows, why would God the Father influence his son Jesus to when he was sitting down and picking his first 12 apostles, why would he pick this guy knowing what he was going to do? That's the question that a lot of people just can't get past. They'll say, you know, well, there's a lot of thought. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Uh, there are several reasons, several reasons I'm aware of. I'm sure there's a lot of reasons I don't know of, but I'd like to share a few of those with you this morning. But above all of it, we need to understand that God always has the ability to bring good out of something bad. He can bring good out of a, what a bad person does. And Judas is probably the best example of that. Remember that Jesus sent his disciples out in pairs. And so they, while they were telling people about the kingdom of God, they were performing signs, which is another way to say they were performing miracles. And they were, of course, preaching. And Judas was among those most likely preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. The Messiah has come, coming from the lips of Judas Iscariot. Can you imagine a person in a crowd hearing Judas say, the Messiah is here? You know, I don't know if he was talking about repentance much, which would be a bit ironic, but could have happened. But someone listening to him and giving their life to Christ at the moment it is actually possible, quite possible, that it happened. Again, we don't read a specific instance, but if he was out preaching, uh, preaching tends to convict people of their sin. And I don't think it's a lot different from today. There are some ministers, and we talk in our Bible study from time to time, I think we did this past week, about some guys on TV that just mm, aren't quite, you know, aren't quite there in their preaching and focusing on money and things like that. And the thing is, all ministers, myself included, we're all imperfect. We're sinners like the rest of you. So we, again, uh, throughout the years, uh, there have been some big name evangelist, and I don't have to give you their names. Uh, you probably know some of them. Been caught in all sorts of all sorts of scandals involving money, sex, drugs, things like that. And uh, just because that pastor gave into a temptation in a very uh, big way, in a that is broadcast, should anyone under his prior teaching feel bad that they came to faith under his teaching? I don't think so. Because again, we all sin just in different ways. And the same thing goes with anyone who might have heard Judas preach and then became convicted. Um, in our, I mentioned our Wednesday night Bible study, we're looking at Philippians right now. <clears throat> and a couple weeks ago, uh, we were looking at the first chapter. And the Apostle Paul writes about how back in his day, there were men who were preaching the good news for some pretty bad reasons, I'll put it that way. Some were envious of others. They were probably jealous that other preachers were getting a lot more attention. And so they said, well, he's getting attention. I'll go and preach this, which again is ironic because back at the time, there was a lot more persecution about people in the church, but didn't keep some people from preaching out of jealousy and that kind of thing. So Paul writes, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? That's what he writes. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So, of course, Paul's not excusing their motives for preaching, but he says, hey, at least we can say he's being preached. That's something good brought out of something bad. 
And there's many, so many other good lessons we can learn from Judas. We'll look at him over the next couple weeks too. But another lesson is that man's choice is rarely God's choice. And what I mean by that is when you compare the 12 apostles, Judas was the most impressive of the bunch. I came across this a long time ago, and then I did some digging this past week, and thankfully I pulled it out and I found it. And it is a mock letter of what it would look like. And they try to put a little bit of humor into it, but you'll see what I mean. What it might look like if Jesus were in our modern day trying to recruit for his uh, apostles and he would submit names to a management company and ask them what they thought about these uh, candidates. And it goes like this. This letter would be written to Jesus, son of Joseph, from the Jerusalem management uh, consultants. And it says, Dear Sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for managerial posts in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests, and we have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. It is the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you're undertaking. They do not, um, they do not have the team concept. We would recommend you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus definitely have radical leadings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. Only one of the candidates shows great potential. He's a man of ability and resourcefulness. He meets people well and has a keen business mind and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you success in your new venture. Sincerely signed, the Jerusalem Management Consultants. And I think there's always a certain amount of truth in any good humor. And we hopefully uh, saw where they were going in that, again, mock letter for sure. But that's how an American company would assess the apostles from a human perspective. And based on the criteria, like I said, Judas was the best of the bunch. He was the best of the ones out there. And look in the Bible at all of these different um, situations where uh, we have unlikely heroes. People who on paper were not, were not anything to write home about. Noah got drunk after his having the faith to build the ark. Uh, Moses challenged Pharaoh despite having a stuttering problem. A little short David took on the giant and defeated him. Uh, Jonah, he preached after running the other way. All those kind of things. Again, Judas was the best guy on paper, but we know how that turned out. And he's a prime example of how just sitting under the best preaching, seeing miracles and being given powers that we could not believe still doesn't always translate to being saved, as we say. And we say, how in the world can that happen? It happens if your heart is far from God. I think that he was a greedy man. We read that later and elsewhere in the Bible. And he was the guy, he was the biggest supporter of Jesus early on. And you know why? He thought Jesus is going to come and overthrow these Romans. And we're going to set up our kingdom now. And he's thinking, if I help him, I'm going to be, again, his right-hand man, most likely. Then there comes a point in Jesus' ministry. He starts to tell his disciples that the Son of Man must suffer and die. Well, that's not what Judas bargained for. 
So then we see what happened. Then he started looking. He, he had his finger on the pulse of the political landscape. He knew when the Pharisees and those guys were looking for a reason to kill Jesus and said, basically figured, well, if we aren't going to get out from under Roman rule, at least I can get 30 pieces of silver for a consolation prize. And we know that he had already been uh, helping himself from the money bag anyway. You know, the old five-finger discount they talk about. So that's the kind of guy this was. But the last, lastly, I want to share this before I wrap up. The biggest reason, I think, why God inspired Jesus to select Judas is so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. It had to happen. God knew it would happen, and just him knowing, though, doesn't mean God forced Judas to do anything. He was a willing accomplice, a willingly, a willing accomplice of Satan who entered him, and we'll talk about that in, in another week. But the lessons of the life of Judas is that the best resume doesn't always translate to the best performance. And that's the problem sometimes we have even in our modern church and all throughout the, uh, the uh, years that um, we can be comparing ourselves to other people. I'm sure the other 11 looked at Judas and thought, man, I wish I could be like him. I mean, he's just got it going on and every, he's a guy I want to be like. And in our modern church, we can compare ourselves to other people typically happens in two ways. We can compare ourselves to other people and say, man, I'm better than that person. Hopefully we're not like that. But the other opposite uh, way to look at it is you can look at others and say, man, I can never be as good as that person. They know their Bible. They are just involved. They're doing everything. And so what happens in that situation is we tend to not even try. Sort of they call it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, I'm here and I'm just not accomplishing anything. They're having a special thing at church. Why even bother, you know? That the other people will take care of it. They're better at it than I am. So both, both ends of the spectrum are both dangerous and worthy of being, uh, being aware of. So I just want to give everyone here the encouragement to serve God to the extent that he's equipped you with the talents he's given you. Uh, look at the other 11 disciples. They didn't allow their supposed inferiority to this guy named Judas to get in the way of them serving God, at least after the crucifixion. We know they were all sort of a mess while Jesus was on the earth, but that's another thing. Uh, but you had lowly fishermen. You had people who just were at the bottom of the uh, social ladder. Uh, but they did great things for the gospel. And every follower of Christ has a ministry. And so as you continue in your ministry, uh, we will pray in a minute here that uh, you will serve God with the talents that he's given you again. And I just hope you remember, it's not so much how you start in the kingdom of God, but how you finish and finishing strong. So let's bow our heads and close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the story of Judas, and it is a heartbreaking and terrible story when we think about uh, the deceit this man was involved in and how he just put on this uh, sort of caricature of himself that wasn't reality. And it's because he was self-centered and greedy. We pray that we would not be that type of a person, that we would truly seek you and your faith in whatever way you would guide us. And God, that's the thing. We aren't the same as every other believer because we are all different, given different talents. And just because they're different doesn't mean those talents are not important. They are because you've given them to us. And we pray that we would have every opportunity to use our talents for your glory. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. We'll close our service this morning by...